Can you see my screen? Yes, I see. Is it clear? Clear, very clear. Very minute. Yeah, how about now? Clear, Dr. Rafi. Very good, very good, okay. First of all, good morning to everybody. I would like to first, uh, first of all, thank uh, the moderator, uh, Dr. Uh, Shara Ra 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 Rawati for the kind introduction. I, I'm sorry, the names are quite difficult. Uh, I would also like to thank the Dean of College of Agriculture from Andalus University, Dr. Busnai for the kind uh, invitation and to the head of the Plant Protection uh, Pest and Disease Department, Professor Dr. Noor Balias. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to, uh, for sharing our experience on uh, ecological engineering. Also would like to thank the, the, the speaker ahead of me, uh, who was very kind enough to make the presentation while I was still uh, in the hospital for a checkup. So thank you, Dr. Uh, 3V Dodo for uh, taking my, my place uh, so that you know, we could continue with this important webinar. I, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, I had a, I had a uh, quick, uh, you know, uh, I was looking at the slides of the earlier speaker and I think he has covered a lot of basic things though it was in Indonesian, but I could understand being a scientist, he talked a lot about ecological engineering. So what I'm going to do today is to share with you our experience on ecological engineering for uh, the rice uh, pest management. So mostly uh, my presentation would be around uh, maybe 45 minutes. The structure of my presentation is I will give a global rice production system, a little information about sustainable pest management. What is the need for it for selected invasive rice pests? You know, I will deal with pests that are very important for Indonesia as well as to the other Asian countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, where we have been working with all these uh, three major pests. One is the rice plant hoppers, where Indonesia is famous for, uh, you know, introduction of the IPM approaches for rice plant hoppers. Uh, in the early 1980s, uh, while I was still with Erie, there was a lot of good work done by the Indonesia the second is about the rice field rats, which is very important also in Indonesia and in many rice growing countries of the Asian region. And third is the invasive golden apple snail. Now we call it uh, invasive. We do not call it golden apple snail because there are a lot of confusion in terms of uh, uh, which snails are we talking about. Then the second aspect that I will talk about is very basic about the introduction to ecological engineering, especially in rice pest management. So what is ecological engineering? What is the philosophy of ecology? And what are the eco ecological engineering for pest management? And of course, a uh, little about the description of the foundation or the pillars of economic, of ecological engineering, and uh, then the examples of uh, selected invasive species. And, and, a take home message at the end of my presentation. So as you know, rice is a staple food for more than 2 billion people in the world. And uh, much uh, more is needed to, uh, higher yields are needed because uh, to keep up with the global increase in demand, which is around 62% in the next 25 years because of the increase of uh, population growth, as well as uh, the rice area is, cannot be increased uh, anymore. Therefore, the rice production systems are going, you know, uh, uh, intense intensification involving simplification of the landscapes and increased inputs of fertilizers and pesticides. So in addition to, uh, to, to, to this uh, problem, we have a global climate change is favoring the uh, you know, the spread of many kinds of uh, pests, including diseases, uh, you know, rats, snails, and insects, 
and this is causing because uh, this is causing uh, uh, you know the misuse of uh, and abuse of of pesticides in in many parts of the world and uh, this is also leading to the environmental problems as well as the problems that relate to the farmer's health uh, and besides killing the natural enemies of the pest. The losses caused by insects uh, because of the climate change and because of the intensification is ranging from 25 to 100 percent, depending on the crop. You know, some crops they compensate uh, losses better than the others, and in in, in and these uh, losses also depends on the on the uh, area as well as the country and as well as the farmers' practices. So it is therefore very critical that the production system, including the management of the pests, has to become sustainable and ecologically uh, acceptable, ecologically uh, sound in the changing climate. This is the basis of the ecological sustainable pest management, which is ecological engineering that relies on the uh, preventive strategies rather than the reactive strategies. Uh, so some of the interventions are uh, bio-friendly bio or green plant protection methods that we use. And I'll be talking about some of those things that uh, for the three selected invasive species, with the rice plant, plant hopper, the, the invasive go apple snails in transplanted rice, and of course, the, the rice field rats uh, management system that we have developed in uh, through many years of our work. Please understand that all of my slides, there is a link below. So you don't have to worry. You can go to the link and you can look at after our webinar. So the links are available for you to cross to get more information aside from what I'm going to talk about today. So as you know, plant hoppers uh, outbreaks is increasing uh, both for brown plant hopper as well as the white pack plant hoppers uh, in, on thousands of hectares causing millions of dollars in loss because of the use of susceptible hybrid rice varieties. Many of the hybrid rice varieties, you know, based on our work before in, the, in, in my early days in the Philippine Rice Research Institute, I looked at uh, how hybrid rice uh, and inbred rice, the plant hoppers will, will uh, be a problem or will it not be a problem. So what we found out very interesting in these cases is that many of the, of the white black plant hoppers are becoming, uh, they are occupying more niche than the brown plant hoppers in many of the hybrid rice systems. So that's why even today you look at it in many countries, you have more problems of white black plant hoppers in hybrid rice systems uh, compared to the inbred rice systems. Uh, and the second thing that we have observed is because of the increase in temperature, the global temperature, and because of the use of uh, high use of fertilizers and broad spectrum insecticide, it's causing uh, hopper burns and even hopper storms. If you look at the picture on the right hand side, uh, the picture that you usually see nowadays when you, whenever you are going to the restaurants or to the, to, uh, or sitting outside or out of your house, you can see in certain periods of the year, you get a lot of these hoppers coming to the light. So we call them hopper storms. The second pest that I would talk about is the rice field rat. I think this is one of the most chronic problems that farmers encounter every year and every season. In Asia, we, we know that the rodent costs around five to 10% losses. And this 5% loss actually approximate to 30, 30 million tons of rice, which is good to feed around 180 million people for the, for the next 12 months. So, you know, the impact of, of of uh, rat damage is very serious, uh, especially because they are a pest which starts right at the seedbed, 
to the transplanted rice to the maximum tillage, and even until you have harvested the rice, the rats become a problem in the storehouses. So they are a pest. This is one, one pest which is present throughout the, 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 throughout the year, uh, whether they are in the field or after harvest, whether there are problems in, in, the, in the storage areas. The third in, important thing, which uh, is the problem that we observe and which is, is still continuing to be a very serious problem, especially in the current time, is because of the increased flooding. Uh, and this is the invasive apple snail. You know, I've been working on invasive apple snails since the first time it came to the Philippines in 1987. And since that time, I have been working with many countries on invasive apple snail. So you can see a map here of different countries. And these are the countries I have currently have networks in all these countries where we are extensively working on invasive apple snails. And the invasive apple snail is considered as 100 worst invasive alien species. Uh, this is under, from the IUC and the International Union for Conservation of Nature and the Invasive Species Global Database. They have quite, they use the term in the olden days is the golden apple snail, but there the problem is we are not dealing with one species of apple snail. We are dealing with more than two apple snails in most of the Southeast Asian countries in the ASEAN region. The problems of snails are actually three kinds of problem. One is they are cause a lot of loss, especially with the increased flooding. And you can see globally, they are causing a loss of around 55 to 248 billion per year. Second important thing, you know, many, many farmers, many field workers in the in Philippines and even in other Asian countries, they do not have any protective clothing. They do not have uh, shoes. So, you know, these snails, they are carriers of the, the rat lungworm parasite. You see the nematode that is on the left-hand side, the last photo, and this shows that this nematode is, is a major health problem that is causing the farmers. And recently now we are working extensively with, with a lot of countries, including with the University of Hawaii on looking at uh, the, the infestation of this rat lungworm parasite in many of the Asian countries and including in the countries where the snails have invaded. The third is the problem of the spraying it's also causing a lot of, uh, of health hazards. In the past, there was a lot of problems with the organotic compounds. So, you know, the animals, the farmers, they used to lose their nails from their toes and in the hand. But those compounds, because of our work, those compounds cannot be used anymore and they are already banned. The second thing that we have recently found for the last few years, that in direct seeded rice, the, when you spray uh, chemicals like niclosamide, which is a very, very common chemical, which is used in almost all the Asian countries because it is fast acting and it is very pharmacy, it very effective because this is causing the problems of uh, the establishment of, of direct seeded rice. You look at the roots, the roots of the untreated fields are much longer and the seedling height is much higher. Whereas in the treated fields with the clozomide, this is causing uh, retardation and is also causing the, 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 the plant to get exposed for a longer time for the snail damage because the snails usually prefer uh, younger plants. So the economic health and environmental problems that are caused by the invasion or by the apple snail are irreversible and the cost is very enormous. So what is ecological engineering? You know, this is very, very interesting topic, uh, which actually, you know, it's not, it's only now its importance has been realized, but it was as early as in 1962, Odom, who was a famous ecologist, he actually termed 
used the term ecological injury. He was the one who coined the term ecological because to deliberate manipulation of the habitat to benefit for the benefit of the society and natural environment. So in simple term, ecological engineering is a human activity that modifies the environment according to the ecological principles, thereby enhancing resilience and sustainability of farming systems. So in short, ecological engineering is all about how do you manipulate farm uh, habitats making them less favorable for the pest and more attractive to the beneficial organism. So beneficial organisms, you know, in the earlier presentation, they were also shown uh, uh, the, the, the ecosystem landscape where the presenter has shown decomposers, the natural enemies. So these are benefit to the beneficial organism. So ecological engineering is a new direction for management of agricultural forest by increasing the abundance, diversity, and functions of natural enemies in agricultural ecosystems by providing refuge uh, and alternate or supplementary food sources. It also reduces the herbicide, uh, herbivore damage by providing resources for natural enemies. So what are the culture, mostly the focus of the ecological engineering is to manipulate the habitat by using, you know, the cultural techniques that farmers are using for many years. So if you look at in the olden days, you know, I still remember when I was a small school, uh, high school student, I see my grandfathers and my ancestors and the other villagers in my, in my village. You know, they used to use a lot of cultural techniques, like, you know, they used to have a lot of flowers, uh, planting flowers near their, near their fields, near their house, which is uh, in, in the same area where the, where the fields are there, where the crops are going. So, you know, now we are trying to understand what they were used to do they were actually using the ecological, uh, uh, the e ecological engineering principles, but at that time that term was not coined. But they had to, they use different cultural techniques to manage uh, ecosystems, uh, health, as well as their production systems. But they were doing it, and now we are putting a scientific basis to 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 what they were actually doing. So ecological engineering, as I said, is going to use a lot of uh, different cultural techniques. So I've listed a lot of uh, techniques that are going to be shown here. And these are actually currently the FAO agroecological principles. The agroecological principles are actually based and ecological engineering, the system for rice intensification like SRI, they are the ecological engineering techniques that are used to, man to manage crop production and crop pest management practices. So in ecological engineering, there are two things. One, you restore the biodiversity. And secondly, is to conserve the biodiversity. So you can restore biodiversity by using different techniques. Like, you know, instead of growing uh, a single crop of, of rice, you have crop diversification. You grow different kinds of crop in, in, in an area to increase the diversity of the varieties. And also, uh, you plant, the people are now planting this ecological engineering. I'll show you in other countries how it has benefited, especially planting of nectar flowers around the barns or around the fields. And the second is to reduce the use of insecticide. You know, we have done a lot of work in with many countries, because when I was working with Erie and also with Phil Rice, we are promoting that we should not be spraying for the first 30 days, for the first 40 days. The basically, because now we understand that the rice crop has a lot of compensation ability. It has the compensation to recover from insect damage or disease damage. The second is avoiding using insecticides to prevent the, 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 the kill 
of beneficial organisms, which are important for many people. So the second, both of these techniques, the restoration and the conservation technique of biodiversity helps in the species biodiversity, you know, uh, parasitoids, predators like wasps, uh, beetles, ladybird beetle, and other kind of predators like spiders, decomposers like, you know, what was the earlier uh, columbolans that was shown in the earlier presentation, uh, or, and even, the, the, the soil organisms. And these species diversity improves the eco ecosystem functions, especially for pollinators, for parasitism and for predation. And then the ecosystem services like reduction of uh, pest invasions and regulation. So if you see on the slide, on the, on the right hand side of the slide, the first photo shows you know, many of these farmers are growing string long beans, which is very common, whether in Indonesia or Philippines or China or Vietnam, they usually grow this for uh, along the side of the plants. The second is also there are now a lot of these uh, different kind of string, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, soybeans or other uh, leguminous crops, they are being planted in China and in other countries along the side of the, of the rice field. And the third is reduction in the use of, of pesticides. So in the, in the rice uh, ecological engineering, especially for the, for the rice pest management, the first scientist who actually introduced or demonstrated this uh, broad application of ecological engineering was Dr. Jeff Gurr, he's an Australian. And, you know, Iri has been working very closely with uh, Dr. Jeff. And, you know, he was the first person, they, we had a, a multi-country study uh, in many countries in the early 26, in the 2016, in the, uh, in the early years of, of 2000. And, you know, uh, there we have shown how the increase of abundance of parasites and parasitoids of the principal rice pest, basically because we at that time looked more on plant hoppers and the rice leaf folder, which is also a serious problem in the Philippines. Now the, the ecological methods that are being used are, uh, you know, vegetable strips or flower strips, as I, I showed you before, marigold, which is very old, old practice, sweet basil, which is also very old practice, usually biocontrol people, they know about the value of these, and especially for, they act as a repellent plant. Like say, for example, for, for, the, for, the, for the control of nematodes, yeah, they are using a lot of marigold. For sweet basil, mostly to encourage Hemineopterous parasitoids and uh, other predators. There, and then there are attractant crops. There are uh, other kind of of uh, techniques which are listed here. So this is some of the techniques you see there. You have a main crop example here, and you have a trap crop around there. This is what we are using in rice to um, uh, to manage rats using that uh, the trap barrier system, which I will show you a little later. And this is the second, the same thing you see, this is a rice crop. And this is the trap barrier, the, uh, the, the young rice crop that is grown around there, much ahead of the main crop with the trap barrier system. The second is the strip crop, trap cropping. And then there are other techniques, like say, for example, you have mustard, and then you have this crucifer, this uh, ball cabbage. So you attract the diamond black moth to the trap crop, Kill uh, you. You can get rid of the of the in the trap crop. You can manage the 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 DBM the diamond back moth on the on the trap crop, and so that you will have less problems of of diamond back moth on the main crop, which has more uh, profit to the farmers. This is a typical example of which we are using. Many countries are now using is a is a vertical vertical grass. I think everybody knows in many of the countries where vertical grass is usually grown for, you know, prevent erosion, prevent, uh, you know, uh, 
because of the of the flooding so vertical grass and even in the slopey lands to prevent degradation of the of the of the soils so this vertical grass and uh, what we have found out is uh, that it is a very good attractant so what happens stem borers they come and lay eggs on the vertical grass instead of the rice because they prefer vertical grass has some kind of compounds so vertical grass is uh, is a trap crop which is actually like it pulls the stem borers to 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 eat so the stem borers they lay their eggs there so once the eggs are laid they hatch and then they 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 cannot the, the larva is unable to survive because of certain compounds that are present in the in the in the vertical grass so you the, the stem borers the, they you, they have a natural death so you have less damage uh, to 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 the to the to the rice crop so this is something like uh, a, a, a research which is now widely used for ecological engineering in vietnam china and also we are using this in the philippines so there are three pillars in ecological engineering the main is to maximize the natural biological control services which i have actually explained in my earlier slide we want to increase the biodiversity and the abundance of the natural enemy community so in the first plank that i mentioned is and which i have shown in the earlier slides is to prevent early season sprays for the first 40 days the second is we build up the predators on the detrivore prey the detrivore preys are like you know chironomids and other uh, which are not which have uh, which are neither uh, i can say harmful nor they are uh, beneficial to rice but they are okay. beneficial Excuse me. There's somebody is talking. Hello. And the third plank is the the enhancement of the parasites and predators. So this is what I have shown in the in the the three foundation. So this is the first one. So if you reduce the the in the early application of uh, insecticides, you reduce the the problem of you control the hop the leaf hoppers to around 86.5 percent but you reduce uh, uh, you 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 reduce uh, you did not control uh, uh, leaf hoppers then you have uh, but if you control leaf hoppers then you get a problem of plant hoppers to almost ten folds so what happens is that early application of insecticides is causing a problem in the resurgence of other pests so this is on the right hand side you will see a graph and this is my phd work in 1980s and until today all of this is been uh, widely used because the, i have shown in the field that if you have a resistant variety and a susceptible variety and you spray insecticides whether it is a resistant variety or is susceptible you spray it for brown plant hopper in the early days that is around 10 days after transplanting you will get a hopper burn on the 35th day so this is what i'm saying so what happens you can see the spiders they drastically decreased uh, in the spray treatment as well as the hopper population exploded in the at the around 35th day uh, after the application of insecticides the second is to build up on the detrivore sprays there are these are neutral animals that mean what i mean say so they are like columbulans the chironomids and all that they are widely present in the rice field especially during the start of the season so this is just to show the rice ecosystem food web this is the the aquatic habitat the crop habitat and the non rice habitat you know many times we can try to control the many of these pests on the on the crop habitat 
but we do not lo look at what is happening in the non-rice habitat, which has a big influence on, on the management of the pest in the rice habitat, as well as in the past, you know, very little work has been done on looking at what is happening in the aquatic habitat and the non-rice habitat to maintain ecosystems. And the first work that has widely been used uh, work by, by Bill Settle from FAO, he did a lot of work in Indonesia on looking at the, these aspects together with Dr. Kevin Gallagher, formerly with FAO also, on the importance of the aquatic habitats and the non-rice habitats to manage the, the invasives, uh, to manage the rice pests. The third one is the enhancements of the natural enemies. And I was telling you, like in China, they are growing, uh, you know, sesame plants, which have a lot of flowers. They are rich in nectar to improve the, the, uh, the, the efficiency or to increase the abundance and biodiversity of the, of the natural enemies. And what we have also found in the Philippines as well as in, the, in China and in other countries, including Vietnam, that if you have clean buns, you have lower spider biodiversity. And you know, spiders are the major predators of rice pests in the rice ecosystem. In the same thing in Vietnam, we have found that the buns which have flowers, they have increased level of parasitism of plant hop for eggs. And same thing in case of Thailand, we have also seen that the fields that are surrounded by flowering plants have higher biodiversity of natural enemies and abundance of natural enemies. So this is a typical field in China, you can see the flowering plants and this is the rice field. And then you have uh, undisturbed habitats. You can see on the background, the trees and the other uh, uh, vegetation. So I have talked about this in my, in my earlier slides. So it's about habitat diversification, agroecosystem management, and uh, uh, the, if you have uh, polyculture crops versus you know, uh, single crop, then you have uh, monoculture over polyculture has a lot of implications on ecological engineering. So these are the, in nutshell, in the, in the, what I've shown is in the three habitats, you have parasitoids, you, they are, the main job is to regulate and what are the good agricultural practices that has to be followed to in, enhance uh, parasitoids, predators, and about the detrivores, which earlier speaker has talked about is the Colombians, the, the air fit flies, they are helping in nutrient cycling as well as in the organic matter. So they are supporting, their job is supporting the agro ecosystem. And the third one is the, the earthworms, the termites, the millipedes that are usually in, in, in the healthy ecosystems and they are again supporting. So the parasites and predators are regulating whereas the detrivores and the soil ecosystem engineers, they are supporting the ecosystem services. So the, this is above ground and then which I've already talked about it. And the second is the below ground that is, you know, uh, earthworms, detrivores and, and uh, you know, the mycorrhiza and other things that enhance biodiversity as well as, uh, this one. So in the Philippines, you know, Dr. K. R. Young, who is a Malaysian, who has uh, been with IRI for many years, is retired now, but he continues to work uh, in other countries, uh, in China and other countries uh, uh, on uh, ecological engineering. So he was actually the first person who introduced ecological engineering in the ASEAN countries in 2008. And, you know, I, I he was my he was my postdoctoral uh, mentor. And so we worked very closely uh, in the early days or, or with him on the ecological engineering. So uh, the first experiments were conducted in China in 2009, and then they were followed by Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia. And now I think also in Indonesia, there are some work that is going on in some universities. 
this is the main uh, ecological pest management in nutshell is the main important goal of the ecological pest management or ecological engineering is to maintain healthy plants from root to foliage so you know in the past like in sri we are looking at the system for rice intensification we are looking at more on the root health rather than because the root health dictates the health of the of the foliage so you know you should that's why in in sri technique and sri is widely indonesia is one of the countries in in the in the region that have the highest promotion of sri and then in india also sri is widely practiced so the ecological principles the ecological engineering principles are actually the ecological engineering principles are used also in sri which actually uh, pest management are also uh, one of the principles in 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 sri so this is a typical example i i am repeating again some of the ecological uh, uh, demonstrations that were first done in china so you can see there was a trap crop on the side and there was a sesame on the on the on, along the bunch and then there is a zizinia the also on the other side so this is a typical example of uh, rice plant hopper which i was showing you is a very serious problem so these are sesame plants which are grown on the side so planting flowering plants to provide nectar to parasites and predators sesame is planted on the bunch on the rice side before rice transplanting and few months after one month of rice planting to ensure sesame flowers are present so they provide the food for the natural enemies while the pest is, is still coming in so what we have found out that the egg parasitism was higher by 45% in fields that has sesame flowers compared to and the, and then the hopper densities decrease the population decrease by 30% this is what is also shown in the graph on the on the on the right hand side so with flowers and and without flowers that means and the same in terms of the both the brown plant hopper as well as the white back plant hopper so this is an excellent technique and you know during my post doctoral work before i have found out lot of natural enemies like anagrus the hemineopterus parasites and the other predators they are usually uh, very uh, they are present on other alternate hosts along the side of the bunch so that was my post doctoral work that i did in eri that we were able to find that uh, this increased a lot of um, uh, reduction in the in the plant hopper problems this is a uh, this is a, a perennial grass that i was telling you the zazenia which is usually growing along the rice fields not only in china but also in other countries and they provide an important uh, alternate host for the for the parasites uh, and predators during the periods of uh, when the rice plant hoppers are still not available and uh, i talked about the egg parasite which is a very important parasite uh, and also about uh, which is usually present which is a major parasite of plant hoppers but it also attacks other kind of plant hoppers that are found in this grass so you know when then when the brown plant hopper comes in they move to to the so this diagrammatic the second in the middle is showing the movement of natural enemies in three habitats so this is a non rice habitat the rice habitat and the aquatic habitats so there is a lot of movement that is going not only during the day but as well as during the night because i have seen in my work in the night the crickets they move from the from the non rice areas to the rice areas and in the daytime they are taking shelter in the non rice habitat these are some of the of the of the flowering plants you don't have to only have you know the flowering um, you can also use uh, other leguminous crops or other uh, uh, other uh, families of the of the of the uh, cultivated crops to use as uh, as uh, 
plant for nectar. So this is the example I showed about the stem borer in China before, that how the vertical grass help in managing in reducing the, uh, the damage to, the, to, to rice stem borers in, in rice. The, this is a multi-country, multi-year project. You know, Bangladesh is doing a lot of work and, you know, Philippines, a lot of work has been done by my former colleagues and they have looked at what are the positive as well as the negative impacts of some of the ecological engineering work. So this is a work in progress. And you know, over time, we are improving, uh, improving a lot of uh, uh, research on it. One of the examples I want to also show you that sometime with the ecological engineering, we have seen, especially when you do not have much destruction of non-rice habitat, the rat damage was high. So now we are also looking at that aspect of uh, how to solve the, the problem of uh, rat management. These are some of the ecological engineering practices that are followed in not only, this is in Indonesia, Java. My good friend, Mr. Jatika, who's uh, doing a lot of work on SRI and he is an organic person. And uh, you know, even the safe network, which is in the Andalus University, of which Dr. Nobizar Nazir is the global coordinator. We are doing a lot of work on SRI uh, safe rice. We call it safe uh, SRI rice in, uh, in uh, Bali, in Indonesia, with uh, university, with the university, uh, with the many universities there in, 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 in Bali especially the University of, uh, uh, I'm not remembering the name, it's uh, Varmadeva University. We are doing a lot of work with Varmadeva University there on SRI using the ecological principles. And these are some of the photos in different areas of the Philippines where this uh, technology is now widely is being practiced by the farmers. So the second aspect I want to show is in the rat, how we are using this technique. You know, in the rat management, this we develop in Philippine Rice Research Institute, and this is now widely used. Uh, even uh, Erie has uh, supported our work on this. We were the first people to start this project where we develop ecologically rat management system. So our main purpose was because we were spending around 3.5 million for the management of rat in our institute farm in the Philippine Rice Research Institute from 2004 to 2004. It's a lot of money for the management of rat. So at that time, we had a very, you know, we had a very reactive type of, uh, we used to apply sustained baiting of, of uh, chronic as well as uh, acute rodenticides before planting, during planting, after planting, so we spend a lot of money. Then we uh, introduced this technique called the trap barrier system plus the trap crop. So you can see there is a much older crop that is growing in the, inside the plastic enclosure and the younger crop uh, outside, which is much, much young. So we are able to use a, a variety of rice, uh, 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 an aromatic variety of rice inside the trap crop to, to attract the rats before the farmers will start planting their rice. So we are able to reduce the reproduction of rats before the rice planting season by the farmers. Dr. Rafi? Yeah. Excuse me. Maybe yeah. Maybe you only five minutes more. Okay, sure. I, I think I'll be done with that five minutes. I, I, I'm almost there. And uh, this is how we have done. We have done the, the step one. We have, we have done the digitization. The second is we have understand the biology of the rat during the different stages of the crop so that we know what actions to take at different stage of the rob. And the main impact of this work is that 
we were able to reduce 83% reduction in chronic and 94% reduction in acute rodenticide. And we came out with an excellent book. It's a global book. We have chapters from all the rat experts and from Erie and from others. And this book you can download for free, of course, on the internet. And the link is to the book is provided as well as uh, uh, all the information on how we did this and how successful it is widely used by the farmers. This, uh, the, the last one is the invasive apple snail. We have developed a technique where we are able to reduce completely the use of chemicals by, uh, by our technique. So these are some of the techniques that we have developed using the ecological engineering principles. And uh, now farmers, they do not apply a single chemical for transplanted rice. But for direct seeded rice, we are still developing a technique on how to minimize the use of rodenticides. These are some of the publication. Again, all of this, this book is the latest book on the right-hand side on the extreme, the biology and management of invasive apple snail. This is a global book. There are chapters from all over the all countries and including the earlier book where there is a chapter are also from Indonesia in the earlier book on the invasive. And now recently we have come out with the country reports from all the ASEAN countries. We have a report from Indonesia, from Myanmar, from Malaysia, from, you know, in Indonesia, from the India, from the Institute of, of Science in, in Bogor, in Bogor. The, the researchers from Bogor who are working on snails, they have contributed, and this is all published internationally. So the impacts and the, my take home message, the last, this is my last slide. You know, the ecological engineering principle is a, is a ongoing uh, for pest management is still ongoing. We need to do more uh, of this research and also we need to motivate farmers by using ecolo to adopt ecological engineering techniques using non-formal education techniques. And thank you so much for the presentation. And this presentation is a joint presentation from the Philippine Rice Research Institute and the SAFE Network uh, uh, Indonesia. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Rafi. It's very, very complete and valuable knowledge uh, that you're sharing to us uh, today. And in briefly speaking, I want to say that uh, ecological engineering is preventive strategy than reactive strategy. Less yeah. favorable for pests, more attractive to natural enemies, restore biodiversity and conserve. And you also suggest to grow a flower and vegetables in rice plant, and also inform how to maintain that in rice field. Very good, very amazing. Uh, all participants, uh, it's that we have. Uh, 20 minutes more for discussion. Uh, uh, I invite you all to give some suggestions, response, or more information about that. And firstly, I want to see chat box, chat box. And after that, uh, I will give a opportunity to audience to uh, question. Uh, first, from the chat book, from the chat box from Nini, uh, I think uh, this question is addressed to Dr. Rafi. I have seen about Fitifer Grace. What you explain about what is what the function of Fitifer Grace in the research? This is the first question for Dr. Rafi. Uh, excuse me, can you repeat? There was some uh, problem of uh, the voice. Can you repeat it? Okay. Uh, from the chat box, I have one question for you. Yeah. Yes, from uh, Nini. Okay. He said, he said, I have seen about Fitifer Grace. Yes. Okay. Fitifer Grace. Yeah. What do you explain about that? Yeah. yeah. What the function of 
fetifer grass in the research? Okay, uh, the, that's a very good question because you know what uh, what is happening is that we have studied uh, you know China the, uh, and Philippines and other countries, especially for vetiver grass is along the you can usually see it. Yeah, now it's widely promoted in China because what is happening is that it attracts the stem borer egg, um, stem borer adders to come and lay the grass or their eggs on the grass. So, you know, it is like an attractant. It is, uh, it attracts, there is certain kind of, of uh, chemicals that are emitted by the, by the vertebral grass that attracts the adults of stem borer to come and lay eggs and they prefer the stem borer prefer to lay eggs on the vertigra grass more many many times than the rice plant so now once the eggs are laid they hatch and once they hatch the usually the stem borer they go inside uh, the the plant and then there because of that chemical that is present uh, the, the larva doesn't grow, it doesn't mold, it doesn't become to, uh, to further instars, so it has a natural death. So the use of vertigal grass is to attract and kill the stem borer uh, larva so that you can reduce the reduction of stem borer damage in the main rice crop. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Rafi. Okay. Uh, the Bo second Bo question, Bo yeah. Bume, Bume. Pa pa yeah. Okay. Question? Oh yeah, I have a question. Please. Okay, makasih, Bume. Uh, good morning, Dr. Joshi. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Joshi. Dr. Joshi, I am yeah. also UPLB alumni. <laughs> Alum, yeah. uh, I, I, I got my PhD in 1984. Okay. I did, I was, I, I was there for five years. I worked with uh, Dr. Thomas Masao. Oh, okay. Dr. Dr. Elisio Kadapan. Oh, okay. And, and my classmate is Dr. Joe Hernandez. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, I know okay. all of them. Okay. Thank you. I was there before. I am a plum reader. Uh, okay. I am a plum reader, but I am very happy to join you talking about ecological engineering in pest management. Yeah. Uh, because our task right now, how to reduce the use of pesticide and then go back to the organic farming. Okay. That is our message. I think the is, but <clears throat> but varieties uh, uh, is one still one of the important component in pest management, of course. Especially, yeah. I will be focused on rice plant hopper. Okay. Because this uh, hopper is now uh, very what do you call it? Still very serious in yes. West Sumatra. Yeah. Why? Because we have limited number of varieties resistant mm. to plant hopper. Okay. Why? Because in uh, West Sumatra, we have special quality of rice. Rice. Exactly. We, have, we are using a uh, high amylose content rice, not I low. <laughs> right. <laughs> like I that. Another place, okay. So my question is that, uh, how is the development of breeding for uh -huh. or using resistant varieties? The importance of using resistant varieties in uh, your pest management in uh, field rice, in okay. field rice uh, research. So, so yeah. how how it is important? And then my second question is that before I was there, I was uh, making my master research is developing uh, 
BPH biotype on different rice variety with different gene for resistance. <laughs> so I was to the I was about to develop a new biotype by rearing uh, the insect with different um, varieties. So my question is that how is the development of plant hopper biotype right now, and what is the progress of breeding for brown hopper resistant species and a theory might be also a uh, field right. So this is uh, two question that I would like to hear from you. And then the, the next question is that because our approach in ecological engineering is not a, a distant, what do you call it, reason like using pesticide. So we have, we need also to have something social engineering to adopt ecological engineering in pest management. So how is the social engineering that you experience in uh, a different country in order to adopt the EE in pest management? Thank you very much, Dr. Yossi. Thank you very much, uh, Bapak Dr. Rashidin. And I think I'm sure uh, Dr. Rafi uh, can understand what yeah yeah that is uh, i understand all the three questions very okay. well because You're professor right. rasadin is very very clear in asking uh, those questions you know uh, first of all i want to tell you that all the names you mentioned they are all my good friends and you know uh, dr masaho and me we worked together in nigeria in iita in Nigeria, he was with the, he's a plant breeder. I am a rice entomologist at uh, IITA in Nigeria. So we 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 you know we we work as a team. And Joe Hernandez and me work together in field rice. And Dr. Kadapan is uh, also one of my very good friend. Unfortunately, Dr. Masaho and uh, Dr. Kadapan have died. Yeah. 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 So we are, I'm, we are very good friendly friends until now. Yeah. Uh, so the question, the first question is about the rice breeding for in, in field rice. You know, most of the varieties that are released in, by field rice, the, the Philippines are by the uh, are Philippine seed born, uh, seed board uh, approved varieties. And many of these varieties, they have uh, resistance to most of the, the major uh, insect pests, especially brown plant hopper, uh, white back plant hopper, brown uh, green leaf hopper, and stem borer. Uh, those, those, uh, and also for the diseases, the, because this this is a basic requirement before you can release any variety. So you know, field rice is continuing the work. Yeah. Is continuing the work on this. The second is about the biotype thing that you mentioned about the bio. You know, this will take me a lot of um, discussion on this. You can, you know, what happens if you if you subject uh, the field population to different varieties you, over time, just like you know now uh, you you say biotype, but now we nowadays we are not saying biotypes. We are saying populations because, but you know, you can create uh, the because of the selection pressure whether it is insecticide, whether it is a resistant variety, you can produce uh, populations that become resistant. It's, it's, a, it's a biological phenomena where you fight, where it, like, like today, you know, I had my, uh, for my, I, I was uh, having my test for my COVID. So, you know, I, I also thought if I'm found positive, I will develop also uh, my body will also fight to, to survive. So it's the same in case of, of, of biotype problem. So, you know, whether we say insecticide resistant uh, brown plant hopper or other plant hoppers, we will develop this over time. It's a, it's a biological phenomenon. The third one is about social uh, engineering. That is very important. You know, we want to find out why some farmers do not like to practice uh, ecological uh, practices that we are we are promoting. So that is why in my last slide, mm -hmm. in my last slide for social engineering, we have to we have to promote 
the ecological engineering using no, non scientific no, like non formal methods like you know we have dramas you have tv programs we have we have uh, more of a social interaction rather than the actual research so you know it's a social research social engineering is very crucial and you are right in this thank you so much i hope i have answered your questions okay thank you very much thank you dr rafiq and we go to the second question if it is addressed to dr there is uh, one question for you at the chat box. Uh, plankton, siromidae, dan kolembola ada lagi plankton yang lain musuh alami. Bagaimana syarat hidupnya? Uh, the question like that, Dr. Hermanu, are you still here? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank question the doctor. From Herlina, Pak. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Josi about the, uh, the new information about all of the things associated with the uh, ecological engineering. I think we are, we are on the same track about that one. Uh, before answering uh, from Herlina, I think I would like to add of the, for, for, the, for the question from Pak. Rasidin, I think there is a long discussion about the role of the uh, uh, breeding program for the combating the rice pests, for example, that one. So uh, most of our concern on an ecological perspective is that, that uh, as far as, as long as we are not using the pesticide as a lesson pressure, uh, we won't have any problem on brand panel. So that's why the, the focus on, on BPH uh, resistant variety should be uh, like revise it for that one. From uh, the presentation of Dr. Yossi, you see that whether it is resistant or non-resistant variety, if you apply insecticide in an earlier time of the rice uh, plantation, uh, before for the for for several reasons, and for example, for the life order or in Indonesia, in most cases, be, uh, to combat a rice stem border. That's why in uh, my earlier slide, the first slide I show that why by uh, conserving the natural anatomy of stem border while in the seeding stage is very useful to avoid pesticide application on our states of the rice growth. Therefore, if we, can, if we can postpone or maybe it's, uh, uh, prefer not using pesticide, then there won't be any problem on brown brand hopper. That's why the, for the breeding, I think the, we, it is a long way we have uh, not mentioning about the biotype on the ecological engineering. That's that's one of my addition. For the uh, uh day or other uh, day three or four that uh, Dr. Yossi mentioned, uh, Bu Helena, I'm not <laughs> wrong. Uh, it is it is uh, part of the what Dr. Yossi called a, a below ground management with the using uh, organic matters, uh, uh, not taking the rice straw from the field, the decomposure, and then the intermittent irrigation that might be help to promote the good environment for the uh, columbola and uh, siromide. Uh, the population as a part of the uh, prey for the predators, the general predator. As uh, Dr. Yossi mentioned about bill settle work in Indonesia, uh, that's uh, on uh, that's the focus of giving early 
prey for the predator so they can survive. And when the pests, whether the PPAs or the pests come, uh, they will control it. So I, I think that's a that's, uh, uh, thing. The problem is that, uh, like uh, Dr. Yossi said, it is not easy to persuade people, farmer or maybe decision maker, to believe that without spraying pesticide, we wouldn't have any problem. It is a contraintuitive. So that's why we have to uh, create more creative thing. And we, uh, we now join with us here, uh, Dr. Johnny, is uh, how to, it's not, a, not only just social engineering, how to learn together with Farmer Fit School, uh, learning from the fact, learning from the experience, uh, because we cannot talk without uh, doing this one. Uh, I think I think that's what I, I call out this one. Uh, research on the uh, non pest uh, insect in a rice field is very limited. That's why if, if there is some student would like to uh, to uh, give a research and a part of the ecological uh, engineering promotion, it might be better to right now to look at the zero media population, uh, the effect of organic matter, the relationship with the various predator, general predator from the dragonfly, spider, and something like that. Uh, and also the relationship among the, the refugia plants with other parasitoids. That's a lot, a lot of good uh, basic message that might be good, uh, good to be a, a topic for the bachelor study student and also maybe up to PhD student. I think that's all what I need. Hopefully they can answer all the questions perfectly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hermanu. Uh, thank you for additional information about brown plant hopper, right? And I, I still have one question for Dr. Rafi in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Afandi. I think uh, you know Dr. Afandi, Dr. Rafi? Yeah, yeah. He's a good friend yeah. of mine. Yeah, <laughs> so from Dr. Afandi, he, his question is, uh, some technique to control pests already available but uh, it is not delivered to farmer exactly or accepted by farmer exactly. So uh, his question is, uh, what is the most prominent strategy to make this technology could be well accepted by farmer? Please, Dr. Rafi. Yeah, thank you, my friend, Dr. Afande. Yeah, we, uh, I agree with his uh, question. Uh, what we are doing is we uh, now we are, you know I will give you one example. Uh, when when I was working in uh, in uh, uh, potato leaf miner, which was a very serious problem in the Philippines, there was an outbreak, and I was asked by the minister uh, to show how to to control this problem. So, you know, we had a lot of research. We already have very good research on leaf miners, not only in the Philippines, but everywhere. But farmers were still using a lot of chemicals. So, you know, we use a different strategies. So first of all, what we did is we, aside from that, we developed science, science comic. It's a comic. So now we teach children in the school about leaf miners the farmers' children in the rural areas, that we were, we were teaching them uh, how to manage leaf miners. So when they go home, they show their parents, oh, this is what we learned about leaf miners. This is what we learned about leaf miners. The same strategy, you know, I thought of this as one of the strategy because the same kind of strategy I used for controlling rice gall beach in Africa. We have very good research, we have very good findings, but how to convince the farm? So, you know, 
like you know the the non formal education techniques like uh, you know comics like for example dramas like farmer more of a, of a, you know farmer field schools that are uh, uh, season long not just one day training two day training that doesn't help that doesn't and of course to also have small demonstration plots at the same time when you are doing different non formal uh, education techniques to promote to for the farmers to encourage and you know if i am a farmer i also want to see whether it really works or not before i am going to use it so we have to show it's a show and tell is you have to show and tell and demonstrate that it works and many farmers now so for example in the philippines for for the for the for the potato leaf miners you hardly see farmers in the potato rice grow, potato growing areas using chemicals to control uh, a leaf miner that is leriomyza which is also a serious problem in in indonesia in vietnam so this is my suggestion i think we we have to use uh, more of a non formal techniques rather than you know many of the entomologists many of the crop protection people have to learn about uh, more of uh, farmer behavior and more of doing social uh, you know techniques to non formal techniques to promote the research work that's all thank you dr rafi thank you very much for all speak two speakers for a nice presentation and nice discussion today uh, i think uh, we have limited time so uh, before we close this event officially uh, i invite both speaker to deliver a closing statement maybe for first closing statement I invite Dr. Hermano, please uh, unmute your speaker, Dr. Hermano. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a, a pleasure and a good, with a good experience talking uh, with our colleagues and Mr. Handaras and also meeting with Dr. Yoshi. I think for the the real challenge in the future for the practicing agro agroecological engineering or ecological engineering in the rice cultivation is on the way we can persuade other person that the theory is right and can be done. Uh, the, from my experience, the best way to show that thing is not by not by talking or publishing, uh, but by uh, giving them the result in the field, uh, especially if the it, 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 it is practiced by the farmer. So farmer to farmer is more important to do uh, uh, to persuade other people to practice agroecological engineering. Uh, for the university, I think it might be good to have a partner, uh, partner, partner to work together, and then to learn together, to develop science together. What we call it the participatory technology development, and also in the way we are communicate with public. The in Indonesia, the most in most cases, the the burden, the bottleneck is in a government because the policy sometimes is contraproductive with, with the, 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 the theory and the paradigm. I think it's not only in Indonesia, but also in other countries. And, and also uh, in Indonesia, we are combating with, uh, uh, with the uh, progressive uh, advertising marketing strategy with the pesticide company that we have with, I would like to read with that one because the, we treat the pesticide and as a, what we call what we call fast moving good like a cheeky or like other <laughs> thing that's why we would like to give more regulation and uh, we will ask 
for the pesticide company to cooperate with us to combat with ecological research and also physiological research on the pesticide use. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yossi. It's great to uh, meeting with you. Hopefully, we can work together with Andalas University and also Indonesian scientists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hermanu. And then uh, we invite Dr. Rafi, Rafindra Josi to give closing statement for us. Please, Dr. Rafi. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this uh, very important webinar. I have really learned a lot from uh, uh, some of the, from the earlier speaker, Dr. Harmanu. He was, his presentation was uh, very good. And uh, also his concluding statements. I have every, I think everything I wanted to say, uh, Dr. Harmanu has said very well. So I really appreciate it. But, well, few things that I want to say is that the policy, the most important is you can be a best researcher in the world, but if your government doesn't support your, uh, your, the policy implications, because you know, I have worked also in the policy matters in other countries, because I was the advisor to the minister in Solomon Islands in Fiji. So I saw a lot of good research done by people but uh, you know, it doesn't translate into policy. So the first thing I did was the policy change. So policy, the uh, preparing a policy for the next five years. And so I included some of those things. The, one of the things, why ecological engineering is very famous in China and in Vietnam is because of the policy. China has a policy. China has now a policy. Whichever farmer will do ecological engineering, they will get some subsidy. So now farmers are encouraged because the, first of all, if, I, if you are a farmer, you, you think first is how do you save money? How do you reduce the cost of production? And whether what you are doing is it effective or not? From the scientist's point of view, we know that some of the techniques that we develop, whether ecological engineering or whatever techniques we develop in, in or technology we develop, it has to be first of all effective, less laborious. The third thing is easy to do. And the fourth, it should not cost anything extra to the farmer. So from the technical side, we know that any technology we want to promote as a researcher or a scientist should have those things. Now coming for the policy side, we have to convince the policy makers to translate our findings to a policy that the farmer can be able to. So in China and also in Vietnam, they have provided uh, incentive to farmers who are using ecological engineering principles. Now, like say, for example, in the Philippines now, there is, a, there is a, the cabinet has approved the organic policy. So it is not in conflict. And also Dr. Harmanu mentioned about it, that you know, the, the pressure from the chemical company is very high. So now we are also developing techniques on how the, 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 we can work with the, with the chemical companies to, to, to in, not completely exclusion, but how to integrate in a way that we can still reduce the cost of production because the biggest problem of the farmer is now the cost, the cost of inputs. So, you know, I think the, this present, this uh, seminar is very useful. And I think the universities should uh, now direct some of their uh, students and projects to put more emphasis on ecological engineering. And, you know, we like, so for example, Dr. Harmanu and the other people that I know who have a lot of um, experience on ecological engineering, we set up a cooperative cooperation we set up 
you know, some of us can be thesis uh, supervisors for some of the students. We can, we can share our experience. We can provide the resources like mentoring program. We can mentor. It's not about money. It's about, you know, like say, for example, I'm a mentor for the Merle William Fellowship Foundation, which is under the ACIAR in Australia. I am one of them as a mentor. So I am now mentoring a student from Cambodia and from Fiji. But I don't get paid, but you know, I am able to move the research forward in the way it should go to help the farmers in other countries. So I think the university can, uh, you know, think of not just having this webinar, we can have a series of webinars where we can spend more time on how we can progress and how we can promote further the ecological engineering. And, you know, how we can also help uh, collaborate with other researchers in Indonesia. You know, SAFE network is a very big network in Indonesia. You know, every year we have an annual conference. Last year we could not have it in Jeju Islands, but we did a lot of webinars. So, you know, we, and, and now I hope that in the 2021, the situation may improve. We may be able to move. I think we should organize uh, maybe um, uh, uh, some uh, activity uh, with SAFE Network, which is uh, in Indonesia, but SAFE Network is not only about Indonesia, it's about so many countries. You know, people from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, they are all in the network, in Malaysia. So I think this is one of the areas. And you know, the, the, the university, uh, uh, Andalus University. It is based in Andalus University. I think this is a good opportunity for us. You know, I am the SAFE Network Coordinator for the Pacific Island. I don't get paid, but I like the work because I am able to promote what the future uh, uh, research should be done. So thank you so much. And before I forget, if anybody is working on, on RISE, because SAFE Network has recently asked me to write a chapter on ecological sustainable pest management. Oh, so I, I am dealing, I, am, I will have a separate chapter in the book on invasive species on rice. Anybody who is attending this, who is interested, they can be a co-author with me as long as they can contribute significantly to that chapter. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rafi, for the nice closing statement. And I forgot, I already promised to Bapak Joni. Bapak Joni, masih di sini kah? Bapak Joni, sudah keluar ya? Oke, okay, mohon maaf, tadi uh, saya lupa kalau saya sudah berjanji untuk memberikan beliau waktu untuk uh, membagi ilmunya. But finally, uh, thank you very much for all participants. Thank you very much for the two speakers, the best speakers that I see before. And uh, for Dr. Rafindra Josi and Dr. Hermanu Widodo for valuable experiences and valuable uh, knowledge, uh, how we can collaborate uh, in other events. And and then we go back to um, Master of Ceremony, Dina Saptria. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Dr. Maya Sarawati. Is my sound clear? Yeah. Yes, clear. Okay. Thank you to moderate Mrs. Dr. Maya Sarawati. Thank you so much to the speaker for informative and interested presentation and participants for active participation. Stay with us. We would like to present second appreciation to speakers. So we kindly invite Mrs. Professor Dr. Nurbailis to closing and appreciation. Mrs. Professor Dr. Nurbailis, please come. Okay. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, for the first, let us praise and thanks to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala 
for giving us the opportunity to participate in this event. Greeting also we send to our great prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who had brought us to the bright life like now. The Honorable, our speaker, Dr. Ravindra Yossi and Dr. Hermanu Sriwidodo. The Dean and the Vice of Dean, the Agriculture Faculty, Andalas University. The Head of the Plant Protection Study Program, Agriculture Faculty, Andalas University and the, all the participants yeah. is visiting the yeah. lecturer yeah. who has particip participated in this event. We say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin because we have finished listening what was spoken by our speaker who are competent in their knowledge. The, the exposure of this topic has added to our insight and knowledge in our study of integrated pest management of rice. This event was attended by more than 100 participants from world Indonesia, maybe from Sabang to Merauke. For that, we want to express our special thanks to the speaker who has provided enlightenment and share knowledge to all of us. Hopefully, what you have done is become worship inside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also express the special thanks to all the participants who has passed to follow from the beginning to the end of this event. On this occasion, on behalf of the organizer, we would like to apologize if there are things that are not pleasing in the implementation of this event. That's all. We close this event by reading Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin, Wabillahi Taufiq Wal Hidayah, Wassalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Bo Nurbaili, there are two certificates for uh, the two speakers. Okay. I will share you, I share to you. Wait for a while. Yeah. This uh, certificate for Dr. Rafin Rayosi. Uh, please, you decide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Welcome. And next, Bumis. Uh, this is for Dr. Hermanu. Yeah, this is a certificate. Dr. Hermanu Triwidodo. Uh, terima kasih, terima kasih Bu Nur Bayaris. Yeah. Sehat selalu, penuh semangat yeah. dan kemiripan. Amin. Ya. Terima kasih kembali Pak Hermanu. Ya, saya kembalikan. Dina. Oke. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Professor Dr. Nur Bayaris, for closing statement and appreciation to our speakers. Finally, we come to the end part of this seminar. The agenda is photo session. For this session,